Welcome to Texas 2036's virtual series, Straight Talk Texas, where you have a front row seat to conversations on topics important to our future. My name is Enisha Shropshire, Director of Board and External Affairs here at Texas 2036. In 2019, the Biennial Texas Legislature passed a $250 billion two-year budget, but coronavirus-related business closures and decreases in oil and gas tax revenues this year may have created a budget shortfall. Joining Texas 2036 President and CEO Margaret Spellings to discuss the potential effects the COVID-19 pandemic has had on Texas's budget ahead of the 21 legislative session is Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Glenn Hager was elected as the 36th Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts in November 2014. Before his election as Texas Comptroller, Hager served in the Texas House of Representatives and Texas Senate where he worked on a wide range of solutions to problems affecting Texans in areas such as public education, transportation, tax reform, and government transparency. As chief financial officer for Texas, the 10th largest economy in the world, Hager monitors our state's financial health to ensure it maintains fund balances. Welcome to Straight Talk Texas, Comptroller Hager. It's good to be with you. Controller Hager, thank you. I mean, this is the perfect uh, show for you because we call it Straight Talk Texas. And I think one of the things that, that I and so many appreciate about you is that you are a heck of a straight talker. And um, people have really appreciated the transparency that you've shown through this. You, this has been a big uh, news week for you. So we'll dive right in there. Thank you for your public service. Thank you for your, your honesty, honesty, your transparency, and your straight talking. So uh, where are we? You uh, unveiled a new revenue estimate. You were one of the early people to use the R word, recession, in our economy. Uh, you've been on both sides of the table, in the executive branch and in the legislative branch. Uh, give us a, paint a picture of where we are today, and then we'll talk about where we're going in the, in the next legislative session vis-a-vis -vis the budget. Yeah, just real quick, and thank you for that, Margaret. I appreciate it, and likewise, appreciate all the service that you provide and what Texas 2036 is doing. We're, we're both a lot of data and numbers people, and so, uh, you know, as we say, we're peas in a pod, so thank you for that, and I appreciate all the work that y'all are doing here in the city of Texas. But, you know, real quick, if we just go back to uh, February, Texas was tracking ahead of our revenue estimate we had provided last year. We had 50,000 job gains in a month, over 300,000 in the last 12 months. And so therefore, the point being was the Texas economy was entering into this in a really strong position. And obviously, things changed drastically in March. And yes, with the double headwinds of the global pandemic, a lot of what we didn't know at the time, and obviously, there's still a lot of things we don't know still to this day. But one certainty is that, unfortunately, the question whether the pandemic would kind of fade away a little bit as viruses do sometimes with the seasonal flu and make it seasonal instead of yearly. We know that's not going to be the case. Unfortunately, it's a it's a month to month issue that we're going to have to continue to deal with and, and learn to live in a new norm. And so I did want to get out pretty early and, and use that unfortunate R word just because I wanted to manage expectations that that Texas was going to be impacted as well. And so during that time period of, of lower oil prices and production, which is one issue that's impacted Texas more than other states because we're blessed with that resource. But when that downturn hits, it's, it's a double impact. And then secondly, with the global pandemic. And so Texas, as you know, we had had a low unemployment rate. We moved up to about 13%. We're about 8.7% now. Um, but unfortunately, well over 2 million people in Texas are unemployed. And so the revenues in the state of Texas have been impacted as well. Uh, if you, if you look at our bottom line revenues, we had, the, the four corners of this state budget that we're living under for this current two years uh, that goes through August of next year, uh, we had roughly about a $3 billion surplus originally was forecasted, uh, more money than the legislature had appropriated. However, now it appears as though that surplus of $3 billion has turned into a deficit of about $4.6 billion. So there, the, the overall impacts to revenues was greater than that, uh, a little bit more like $11.5 billion dollars. However, there's less expenditures in some items such as public education that was originally estimated. And so therefore it was a swing of about seven and a half billion, which is a significant amount of money, but we are blessed. I mean, it's not a consolation prize, but if you compare us to other states, mm -hmm. Texas entered in a better position. Financially, we're in a better position than some of the other states. And so therefore, at least for the current two year buy-in, we think the legislature can certainly weather this storm. The biggest question, which most of us don't know, is how far out and what is the horizon in the future, which is why when I announced the revenue estimate on Monday and have continued to say in all my interviews is that in fact, every revenue estimate has clouds of uncertainty, but unfortunately, 
And this one has greater clouds of uncertainty than ever before because we've not had to deal with a global pandemic. And, and there's just so many things that are unknown, but what, how governments are going to react, not just in Texas, obviously, the United States and worldwide. And then also more, we're trying to uh, get in the psyche of individuals and businesses, which is really hard during a time of uncertainty like this. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm translating all that in a, in a lay way is we've got essentially a solvable problem in the short yeah. run. Talk about some of the other tools that are in our toolkit, the, the potential for federal funds, the, the 5% cut, rainy day. I mean, what are, what are some things that we're going to, the tools in the toolkit in the short run? And so if you look at leadership earlier this year, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and the Speaker instructed state agencies to reduce expenditures by 5% for this two-year budget which since uh, several months were already over of the 24 months, it really means about an eight and a half percent cut. Uh, agencies have turned in those instructions to the leadership and they are working through those. So any of those savings will actually be savings in the treasury starting now, obviously. However, they don't actually get picked up in, in on paper per se until next session in 2021 when the legislature is there and they take action to capture those gains, which are the dollars, again, are sitting in the treasury. They just have to be picked up uh, from a, a mechanism standpoint. So our current revenue estimate doesn't take those gains into account, but we know that they will be coming. Uh, we don't know exactly the dollar figure, have estimates, but the short point is that's not taken into account, so that's going to help. Then obviously another thing is we will have about $8.8 .8 billion in our economic stabilization fund or our rainy day fund, that state savings account. So that's another tool in the toolbox. And then also, lastly, federal dollars that have come to the state of Texas, roughly a little over $13 billion. Uh, the biggest portion is $6.2 billion, which is for COVID-type expenses. There are some discussions in Washington, D.C. that they may loosen what those parameters are for those dollars, and then it could be used in a broader context. And if so, that would be helpful. But those dollars aren't taken into account because right now they're specifically for COVID-type expenses. And even though Congress is talking about potentially additional dollars, we're not taking that into account because until Congress passes it and the president signs it, there's nothing guaranteed. So we're waiting to take those into account when we actually see it on paper and signed by the president. So that leaves me feeling pretty good about, you know, how we're mm -hmm. going to get from here to there through this biennium. But next biennium, as the budget writers come back in January, uh, is, is going to be a really tricky hand. So, so talk about that uh, going forward, the price of oil and gas, long-term issues, you know, you talk about uncertainty and, and clouds, uh, you know, what, what advice do you have for them? Obviously, they've made big commitments around public education. Uh, health and human services is a huge uh, chunk of the state budget. I mean, how are we going to get there? Well, we, yeah, we've been through several of these before, and we found ways to work through them. As a uh, freshman House member in the Texas House, in 2003, I saw my first budget shortfall when we had $10 billion for the current biennium plus the new two one. And then when I was in the state Senate, we had another one in 2011, which that one was very significant. Between the two, the current budget, of what we had to fill in the holes there, plus the shortfall of potential expenses for the next two-year cycle, was $27 billion. Now that was, for lack of better words, a very miserable session. Mm -hmm. uh, one that we found a way to get through it. Um, however, it was very difficult because as you mentioned, when you look at public education, as well as health and human services, more particularly Medicaid, uh, mm -hmm. roughly those two are about two thirds of the state budget. And so they're pretty much guaranteed. And obviously legislators want to keep their commitments to public education, at least all that I talk to. Everybody wants to keep that commitment. And so the real questions are, we need to really get into October and November because the assumptions that we made in this current revenue estimate that we revised and updated and released on Monday has several basic assumptions. One, that being that the economy is going to con continually slowly open up that there will not be any more government restrictions on business activity come this fall. And so therefore, those are large assumptions to make, uh, not necessarily another wave that in, in short, we as in individuals, businesses, as well as government is learning how to live in this new norm. And how do we continue to balance that need of health and safety, not only for ourselves, but more importantly, for the most vulnerable. And then also, how do we continue to have the economy continue to open up and hopefully expand. And so my point is I'd like to really make sure we get in about October and November to test the assumptions that we made in this estimate, because then those will start being the basis for the next revenue estimate, which that will be for the economy here in Texas starting in September 1 of 2021, 
which is a long ways off, and then running for the next two years. And so therefore, you know, it could be a situation to where we could, worst case scenario, have a 2011. Uh, where we have a large hole to fill or figure out. But then another situation is, depending on freeing up some of the federal dollars we've received, maybe the economy is doing better than we had anticipated, we could be in a situation where they don't have that big of a problem. And, and so my point is, you know, right now, I just kind of want to manage expectations that, that, you know, right now we don't exceed the economy just ramping up and recovering quickly. It'll probably be the fall of 2021 before we reach pre-pandemic levels. Even if we see very large gains in some employment data and GDP data, we have to recognize that those are coming off extreme drops in March and April. And so therefore, it, 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 it could be two different scenarios. And you know, I think as we get to the fall, we'll start having a better gauge of the basic assumptions we've made and what direction the economy is going here in Texas. One of the things uh, we've really appreciated about you, Controller Hager, and because it's part of our DNA, is you're a long-term thinker, and you've worked on issues like pensions, healthcare costs for teachers, you know, trying to, yes, keep our eye on the ball and, you know, deal with the moment that we're in, but also be smart about where we're headed and long-term planning around these issues. And that's especially important in the role that you're in now. Can you talk a little bit about how to how to think long term in the middle of a crisis? Yeah, one of the things that when I got in this job, it kind of hit me about three or four months into it is that I really need to talk more about long term responsibilities, long term liabilities, because the legislature, and again, I was one of them for 12 years on both sides in the House and the Senate. And, and you know, it's really you're wanting to look at those, but you're so focused on the two year budget. And, and so, you know, two years is a long ways, but it's nothing like 10, 15, and 20. And so, therefore, we've got to look further out. And so, I'd put together pretty quickly, my team, great team, put together long-term liabilities and, and, and released that report. And so we've made that part of before the legislature gets into session. And say, for example, pension obligations, that, that's one of them that states and local governments have, have not always been the best about maintaining those long-term responsibilities because they're easy to postpone for one more year, two more years, and the next thing you know, you're 15 years of postponement. And so therefore, I think that, you know, the point is, is I'm going to continue to emphasize that. And I think you got to have a reasonable balance. So obviously, the most immediate needs are, are critical. But how do we think longer term? Because the cost, as we continue to so-called delay and kick the can down the road, it ends up being greater in the end. And because next week, I'll have my meetings with our credit rating agencies as we go out for our yearly borrowing, because Texas, like everybody, has a mismatch of revenues in and expenditures out as we uh, send school districts 50% of their money roughly from the state side in September, October, and November. And so therefore, I know that's going to be one of the questions. And so trying to just make sure to continue to highlight that with members, and I know most members know me by now, that Glenn Hager is just going to keep pounding that issue. Because, <laughs> you know, the fact is, is if we don't tend to it, it's going to be there for future generations. And, and, and I made this point, you know, for example, about public education, that if we don't fully make sure we're funding public education as school districts, for an example, have to make a de decision that they may not hire as many new teachers. Well, as someone who's dealt in public education for so long, you know this, that if we don't hire those teachers this year, well, those teachers become a three and a four and a five-year teacher in a few years. And so therefore, we're, we're actually losing that longer term capacity that we need in the system. And so my point is just trying to emphasize, and I appreciate the work that y'all do, is to try to emphasize what we're doing today also has implications longer term tomorrow and in the future. Exactly. And one of the things we've just recently rolled out a strategic framework for Texas with 36 goals and aspirations and setting some targets, comparing ourselves with others and the like. And we have flagged some places where we don't have the data that we need, that we don't know what we should know. And, you know, I heard you give a, a recent interview around this vis-a-vis -vis your, your estimate. And, you know, now you need to look at much of it proprietary things that, you know, telemedicine visits or airline schedules or all those sorts of things. What do you wish you uh, know, knew uh, now in this pandemic, or what are the things that the state ought to be collecting, thinking about as we get smart about the future and the current crisis? I think it's really important that we really keep our eye on the appreciation of the connectivity of the decisions we make today have real impact, the decisions that's gonna impact the health of this state not just individuals with their opportunities, 
for uh, their own personal benefit, their family's benefit, but also longer term as the state and how that, how that plugs in. So we're, we look at a lot of different data points. Obviously, we're looking at a lot of different non-traditional data points today that we've never looked at before. I never knew how many people flew in the United States on average every day until now, and airplanes are sitting on the ground. And obviously, we have you know, very large hubs here in the state of Texas and uh, companies that are based here in the state of Texas and how that may play out, not short term, but long term. And so we're looking at a lot of different things and talking about those in different ways than we have before and hopefully getting smarter about understanding that connectivity of the bigger picture and the smaller picture put together. Because, you know, it's just hard to imagine that Texas as a state is the ninth largest economy in the entire world. Um, and, and so therefore, there's a lot of things that go on here. And how do we use those data points to make a lot better decisions, at least that will impact the longer term as well as the short term. Exactly. And, you know, you said just a moment ago, I mean, you know, these two giant boulders or giant pieces of the, our state budget, education and Medicaid, you know, um, just maybe, maybe you're glad you're not in the legislature anymore as we <laughs> think about those because they're, they are so fundamental to the issues before us, our changing demographics, our future as a state, you know, it, equity issues and racial justice issues and on and on and on. And, you know, we've got to think long term in the middle of a crisis. And, and we want to help you do that and build a movement of, of Texans that are smart enough to get uh, that we're going to, you know, pay now or pay later on some of these things. No, that's right. And one of the things that I, I was half, half embarrassed in part as we were looking at public education last session, we were doing a report for the legislature. I knew that Texas was moving as we gain population, you know, every day, roughly 1,000, 1,200 people a day, depending on half of that is natural growth. Knew that more kids are entering in the public school system. We're a younger, younger demographic than many other states and nations. But with that being said, I didn't appreciate that Texas had crossed over the threshold Threshold of being minority majority in the public school system in 2002. You know, little did I know I had served for this many years and I knew we had moved that direction, but I didn't know it was that far back. And then also the issue that you're having a higher percentage of children in the public school system that are from economic disadvantaged families. And so therefore the point being, and the legislature thought did a good job of taking some proactive steps last session to try to target and focus on those kids because that's our, that's our work demographic of the future. And, and so it's not just for them and their families, but it's also equally and critically important for business opportunities in the future to make sure those kids are well-educated and they have the tools. You know, as we're, tell as we're essentially working from home and kids are, are having school from home, at least at the, the end of the spring, and my kids, you know, they have a computer, they have access, but a lot of kids do not have that access. And one of the things that really concerns me as we enter the fall and maybe even the spring is we've got to find ways and, and, and help school districts that need that additional resource to figure out how do we make sure that we are having all of those kids being connected in because it is really critical for the health of this state, not just for those children and those families, but for the health of this economy as well. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I want to end on a couple of personal questions. One, you've spent a lot of time in public service and we're grateful to you for doing that. And um, I, I can tell by talking to you that you are fascinated by, stimulated by, and energized by your job. I, you know, the ninth largest economy and being the, you know, check writer for that, that's pretty awesome responsibility. What advice do you have for people who, you know, I think it's sad, you know, people think, look at government, and they look at public service, and they think, why do I want to be part of that? Uh, what advice do you have for our young people thinking about that? And, uh, and then last, I want to turn to you uh, and how you're personally internalizing this as a, as a dad with school-age children and, a, and like many families, you know, uh, you know, a spouse that, that is employed and trying to manage all of that. So talk from your heart about public service and about public service in this environment. Yeah, you know, obviously, and in, in, in you've been in public service for a long time, and so you know this, is it's, it's not always easy, but the fact is, I always remember, I'm the one that asked for this job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My constituents are always correct, uh, <laughs> even when they may be yelling at me and fussing at me about something that I have no control over in any shape, form, or fashion. Mm -hmm. I don't work in, in D.C. I don't work for, in the Congress, um, but the point is they're correct, and then we figure out how to answer their questions to get them there, you know, and, and, and so I've always taken it from the attitude of customer service. Um, how, do, how do I, um, one, wake up and realize that whether Glenn Hager's serving or not, Texas is still going to be a good state. You know, it, it's not because of me or through me, but if I can do things to hopefully help 
uh, my constituents and the people that I serve, there's nothing more rewarding, period. And, uh, you know, and, and, and you may not always get as many compliments as you get complaints. Um, that's just how the world functions uh, in a period. But the fact is when you do get those and, you know, I, I get them pretty frequently on my employees of the customer service orientation that we have, and there's really nothing more rewarding than that. And, and it's really rewarding to empower people to make decisions. And that's, what's really fun about this job is I have a lot of employees and you know, they're not, we're all not going to make the best decision that Glenn Hager would have made. But the fact is, is 99% of the time they are and empower them to make decisions and, and, and let the agency prosper and hopefully the people prosper, you know, in the state of Texas. And, it, and it's really rewarding. It really is. And I, you know, hopefully uh, more and more people will be encouraged to enter into public service. I, I do uh, have um, significant pains as, as I watch the state of politics in this country. Now, it's not nothing new. It's always been that way to some degree. Um, it ebbs and flows as it as, as, uh, gets worse or better at different times. But the point is, is that you know, it can seem pretty mean and, and pretty harsh and personal. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that appreciate um, the impact that you're making. And, and it's really, really rewarding, especially when you get to see something and people ask me, what are the most important things you did? You know, and, and really it's just that simple thing that you help somebody that no one will ever know about whatsoever. Those are the most rewarding ones because it's personal to them. And you know that it wouldn't have got done if it wasn't for for you. And so, you know, I highly encourage, you know, a lot of, a lot of people to try to enter that public service and, and you never know, um, you know, you could be that 31 year old kid who knew nothing about politics and end up being a state rep and then a state Senator and then your state controller. Um, it's amazing how God has handed some a great <laughs> country or what, you know, <laughs> that's right. Uh, controller Hager from one straight talker to another. We really appreciate your service. Uh, you've got a tough hand to play. Uh, we want to help you play it and uh, uh, straight talk with our fellow Texans about, about how to wisely and, and uh, smartly spend the resources we have to the greatest good effect. And uh, anyway, all the best to you. We'll be paying attention to you. We'll get you back on straight talk uh, when you have a new estimate and more clarity. Sounds good. And thanks for the partnership. We appreciate working with you all on a lot of different issues. So thanks for the work that y'all do. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you all for watching Straight Talk Texas. If you have questions and feedback, we want to hear from you. Email us at straighttalk at texas2036.org and follow us on social media and sign up to receive our emails. Visit texas2036.org for more information. Until next time, wishing you and your family well. 